So thank you very much indeed for the invitation to participate. Um, what, a, what an interesting but difficult subject. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the bone deformities of Herb's palsy. And just to start off by um, re re rehearsing or reviewing the embryology of the upper extremity a little bit, because that's rather important and interesting in the evolution of bony deformities. Um, we can see that the scapular body in young people with Herb's palsy remains normal in its shape, size and form in the usual case. We also know that there are deformities of the acromiospinal arch and of course of the acromioclavicular joint. And that part of the scapula together with trapezius is derived from a branchial arch and uh, in conjunction with the third part of the scapula, the glenocoracoid block forming the glenohumeral joint are the two parts of the scapula which become most deformed. And I think that is rather interesting. Um, I'll come back to that in a little while, but that will help us distinguish cases of um, other causes of scapular deformity in childhood from those of the Herb's palsy. Here's an example of a three-dimensional plastic model taken from a CT scan of a 14-year-old girl uh, with a group three um, palsy who has great functional and cosmetic uh, deformity and disability. And you can see the great um, deformity of the acromiospinal element, the branchial arch derivative. It's hypoplastic. It's very dysplastic. The scapular body remains pretty well normal in its shape and form, whilst there is no recognisable glenoid, apart from a small stub of bone posteriorly, which my colleague and mentor, Professor Birch, had implanted to try and stop the humeral head dislocating more posteriorly in this girl's infancy. So that bone block at the back of the glenoid is iatrogenic. It's not part of the natural glenoid. In other words, this glenoid and coracoid, which is virtually absent, was never formed at all. And that's very interesting because we all are taught that the deformities of Herb's palsy are due to and consequent upon the nerve palsy, the asymmetry of muscular activity. But this young woman's case illustrates another possibility that actually the potential for those embryological elements to form is largely due to a nutritional, um, a vascular supply during uh, intrauterine growth. And of course, what happens after birth to the parts of the shoulder blade which are potentially able to grow is determined by the asymmetry of muscular pull. But I would um, be very interested in my colleagues' views about the possibility that some babies are predisposed to worse scapular deformities even before birth. If that's true, then there's a very important group of babies which um, we, we need to think about in a different way. And one reason I say that is the glenoid deformities that we see are very similar to other epimetaphyseal dysplasias, um, which are due to genetic vascular deficiencies. It's a fascinating subject, which I haven't got the answer for, but I put it to you that there is something in there. What we're going to consider now, though, are four things. The bony requisites for scapular suspension and scapular orientation. The scapular processes, acromiospinal and coracoid, the scapular humeral joint and humeral length and torsion. Each of these four parts of the equation contribute to shoulder deformity.
thinking about scapular suspension, this is all about the clavicle. Now, the clavicle is often short in obstetric brachial plexus palsy, not just because it has been broken. In fact, clavicular fracture in uh, obstetric palsy is relatively rare. And here are cases of young adult Erb's palsy where the clavicle forms a bony tether so that the scapula is dragged forwards into protraction around the chest wall increasing the loss of external rotation, active external rotation. If we examine such patients, they often have external rotation relative to the scapular plane, but the scapular plane is protracted anteriorly or ventrally. And in these patients, I've um, used the techniques of monorail um, distraction osteogenesis, and you see um, how it's applied, and in this young man, at the full maximal uh, range of um, extension. Now, sometimes one has a regenerate which forms beautifully, as in the case on the bottom left, and sometimes one has a regenerate which is extremely fragile, in which case internal fixation went before the regenerate consolidates becomes necessary. But um, this technique we've written up in the Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics as a way of reorienting the scapula for optimal glenohumeral joint movement. Now, the next bit of the equation, of course, is the acromioclavicular joint. And you see here in the 3D reconstructions of a, a CT scan how in this particular uh, patient with Herb's palsy, the scapula is pretty normal. The acromiospinal process is normal. The glenoid is slightly hypoplastic and the coracoid base very broad. So this is a glenocoracoid dysplasia, that third part of the scapula under the hermia box gene mechanism. But this clavicle is now rotated at its outer end by at least 45, if not 60 degrees. And it's unclear to me why that should happen. It, fe it seems unlikely that this is a contracture of the anterior part of trapezius when the rest of the trapezius appears to be normal. This is interesting because at the medial end, the sternoclavicular joints are usually normal. So this seems to be a true rotational dysplasia of the, of the clavicle, leading to the acromioclavicular joint being at its maximal range of torsion already. So there is no possibility of elevation of the scapula at the end of the clavicle. Now, again, I don't know why this happens, but my treatment for that is a clavicular derotation osteotomy, of course. That makes sense. And that's sometimes in conjunction with clavicular lengthening. Noto notably, the coracoclavicular ligaments in these patients appear to be intact and well-formed. If we go further to the outer end of the acromion, and in this case, you've got a relatively well-formed acromioclavicular joint. So in this case, a, ma a, ma a male patient age 19, the deformity of the distal end of the acromiospinal process must be clearly postnatal and caused by deltoid contracture or a tether in the contracture, as was mentioned earlier. So here is the clavicle that is relatively normal with a, an acromion that is beginning to tilt ventrally and a coracoid that is also tilted ventrally and short. You can see the immense ridge of bone down the anterolateral aspect of the humerus, which I think is the insertion of this very dysplastic or contracted deltoid, which is behaving like an anterior tether. So in these cases, in order to correct the subacromial space um, and to allow the humerus to be brought forward again onto the acromion, onto the glenoid, I beg your pardon, because the humerus is being forced backwards by proximal humeral normal rate of growth velocity, within the crowded space of the acromiocoracoid fornix, it's simply pushed out posteriorly. 
but the humeral head is relatively well formed. So here, in order to get the relatively well formed humerus back onto the glenoid, we have to think about a craniospinal osteotomy and coracoid uh, surgery if necessary to allow the humerus to go back in. But that can't happen if the deltoid is tethered. Deltoid release is difficult when the deltoid muscle is abnormal. So what I have done in these cases is to shorten the humerus above the deltoid insertion to allow the deltoid to be relaxed a little in order to then do the acromiospinal osteotomy. But the problem with that, of course, in a male age 19 is that there's no more growth left in the distal humerus to equilibrate arm length. And many people are very disturbed by dissimilar arm lengths. So one then has to consider distal segmental humeral distraction osteogenesis. The all-important glenoid and the glenoid humeral relationship is even better illustrated in this case by the feature of the deltoid contracture. But there's also the possibility of conjoined tendon contracture. The coracobrachialis is the antagonist of the deltoid. It too is affected in the upper trunk palsy through the muscular cutaneous effect. So both muscles can be contracted and cause this immense crab-like or claw-like closure of the fornix of the, of the glenoid. Now, in this case, the humeral head is abnormal and the glenoid very dysplastic. And trying to restore that relationship would require a version of a triple osteotomy, craniospinal, glenoid and coracoid possibly also humoral. These patients are often, interestingly, because they've never been in a joint articulation, they're often quite comfortable, but limited in function. And it's these patients in whom a derotation humoral osteotomy for functional positioning of the hand in space might actually be the most appropriate treatment rather than an attempt to restore the anatomy of the lateral scapula. However, if you do do a humeral torsional osteotomy to recenter the humeral head in infancy, with growth, changes happen in the humeral head orientation that can be very um, problematic. This girl had an operation in her infancy, age set, uh, 10, and again, age 13, to bring the humeral head uh, from a posterior subluxation into the glenoid. So she had anti-torsion osteotomies twice. Then she grew between the ages of 13 and 17, and as a result, developed anterior subluxation of the humeral head when her elbow was in the anatomic position. So she complained in my clinic of anterior instability. Well, the obvious thing to do with this young lady was to take the plate away and to perform a derotation osteotomy at the site of maximal um, deformity of the humerus, and we have restored her glenohumeral biomechanics in doing so. So we have to be aware that growth influences what happens to our osteotomies, particularly under the influence of asymmetric muscle pull as the child gets older. And if we get it wrong and we try to contain a humeral head where there's anterior tethering, posterior weakness, and we try to block the movement of the humeral head backwards by a bone block, we can generate arthritis. So the principle of containment um, by an obstructing bone block as opposed to a supportive bone block with glenoid osteotomy can lead to very devastating results, which then need other forms of treatment, such as joint replacement. So in that brief summary, I've suggested that we've got four things to consider. Scapular suspension through clavicular surgery, lengthening and derotation osteotomies, and a spinal osteotomy to realign the acromioclavicular orientation. That may require release of the deltoid and consideration of the humeral length. 
We have scapular processes, which are including the acromion and coracoid, where we can undertake shortening osteotomies or realignment osteotomies, but these depend on the soft tissues for their um, ability to correct deformity. We've then got a range of options for treating the displacing and displaced humeral head, including glenoplasty, that is reorientation of the glenoid fossa, or glenocoracoplasty, that's reorientation of the entire lateral angle of the scapula, including the coracoid base, Scapular neck osteotomy, which is even more uh, challenging, where you're reorientating not just the alignment, but also the rotation of the lateral um, scapula. And then various bone block procedures, which, as I've explained, are things that I have learned to not uh, rely upon. That can be done in the later child with uh, additional proximal humor rotation osteotomy, but we have to beware of the effect of growth. So bone deformities must be seen in the context of asymmetric weakness and the contractures or tethers. We do like to try and re restore the bone as a framework to restore muscle length tension relationships, to optimize the actions and the activity of the muscles that are able to work. But we have also, and it's been emphasized by my friends and colleagues already, that have to appreciate that growth influences the eventual shape and orientation of the shoulder and we have to be very careful what we do and when and I'd suggest to you that we have three broad concepts containment of the humeral head in the infant facilitation of muscle activity in the growing preschool child and scapular orientation in the older child together with muscle transfers for elevation. And with that, I thank you very much indeed for this privilege of joining you this evening and for your attention. Thank you very much.